During America's Gilded Age, the mass accumulation of money by families like the Vanderbilts changed the economic, social, and physical landscape of the United States. But once rich doesn't mean always rich. And the Vanderbilts eventually fell from atop the financial and social ladders they once dominated, and went from American royalty to flat out broke. How'd they screw it up? Well, today we're going to take a look at how the famous Vanderbilts blew their fortune. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other famous families you would like to hear about. Okay, time for a good old riches to rags story. Native to the Netherlands, the Vanderbilts got their start in the United States sometime during the late 17th century. The farming family lived in relative obscurity until Cornelius Commodore Vanderbilt came onto the scene in the early 19th century. Cornelius was born in 1794, and at the age of 16, he borrowed $100 from his parents, the equivalent of around $2,800 today. And with it, he purchased a flat-bottom sailing barge. Vanderbilt was working with his father, ferrying goods back and forth from Staten Island to Manhattan, but decided to branch out on his own. He agreed to share the profits with his parents and began transporting cargo in the New York Harbor while undercutting the competition. The shrewd businessman made about $1,000 in his first year, approximately 28000 bucks today, and soon had a small fleet at his disposal. Anyone else feeling lazy already? Commodore Vanderbilt grew his shipping business quickly, especially after he discovered the lucrative practice of war profiteering. Within two years, he'd contracted with the U.S. government to supply outposts during the War of 1812. By the end of that war, he had earned $10,000 in revenue from transporting people and goods from Boston to Delaware Bay. It was a pretty good gig. In 1817, Vanderbilt began working with steamboat owner Thomas Gibbons to ferry individuals between New York and New Jersey. Now, their union line technically violated the state monopoly over shipping held by Robert Fulton, Robert Livingston, and Aaron Ogden. But in the landmark 1824 Supreme Court case, Gibbons v. Ogden, interstate commerce was ruled subject to federal regulations, allowing the Union Line to continue business without issue. By 1827, Union Line was making more than $40,000 a year, which is approximately $1.2 million today. Gibbons died in 1826, so Vanderbilt tried to buy Gibbons' son out of their half of the business. When the son refused to sell, Vanderbilt started his own damn steamship enterprise, the Dispatch Line, and slowly drove the Union Line out of business. Finally, in 1830, the Union Line was forced to sell to Vanderbilt. Knowing a good thing when he saw it, Vanderbilt continued this pattern along the East Coast, buying out competitors or simply forcing them to shut down. By the late 1850s, he expanded his shipping routes across the Atlantic. He also started investing in railroads, especially as economic opportunities presented themselves on the West Coast. Just like he had done with shipping, Vanderbilt gained control of numerous railroad companies, creating a monopoly of his own, which makes sense. He looks like he at least hangs out with the monopoly guy. His efforts not only resulted in massive personal wealth, but also helped standardize many efficient railroad procedures. Commodore Vanderbilt married his first cousin, Sophia Johnson, in 1813, presumably because they didn't have internet dating services yet. So who else is there? The busy couple had 13 children together, 11 of which survived to adulthood. At the time of Commodore's death in 1877, his two living sons, William Henry and Cornelius, did little to inspire their father. He even had Cornelius committed to an asylum on two occasions. The Commodore opted to leave William Henry the bulk of his money around $105 million, but not before telling him, any fool can make a fortune, it takes a man of brains to hold on to it. It was less a piece of wisdom and more of a cruel prophecy. William Henry carried on his father's business legacy, expanding railroad operations in New York to cities like Chicago, Cleveland, and Indianapolis. In fact, between his father's death and his own in 1885, the Vanderbilt fortune increased from $100 million, already more than that of the U.S. Treasury, to over 200 million. When William Henry died, the Vanderbilt money was divided among his eight children. The family stake of the company was left to the two oldest boys, Cornelius Vanderbilt II, who received $80 million, and William Kissam Vanderbilt, who received 60. And then they started spending it. Cornelius II bought a Rhode Island mansion in 1885. 
calling it the Breakers, though we don't think any resident was a b-boy. He employed architect Richard Morris Hunt, who brought in a team of international craftsmen to create a 70-room Italian Renaissance-style palazzo inspired by the 16th century palaces of Genoa and Turin. That sounds expensive. Hunt was also responsible for George Washington Vanderbilt II's North Carolina home, the Biltmore, and William Kissam's New York City mansion, known as Petit Chateau. The Vanderbilts also owned numerous properties on Fifth Avenue, including the Triple Palaces, three townhouses built in 1882. They also owned Cornelius II's townhouse, the largest home ever to have existed on the island of Manhattan. The Vanderbilts also held lavish parties. The creatively named Vanderbilt Ball, for example, was hosted by William Kissam's wife, Alva, in 1883. On account of being nouveau riche, the Vanderbilts were not considered among the top 400 people in New York's high society. In response, Alva held a costume party and invited 1,000 people in an attempt to cement the Vanderbilt family name into the upper echelons. Full of pageantry and excess, the event was described by the New York Times as a fairyland. Guests wore embellished costumes and spectacular jewels, all hoping to outdo one another. According to the Museum of the City of New York, most contemporary sources put the cost of the ball at a quarter of a million dollars, or nearly six million dollars in today's money. Commodore Vanderbilt, the OG, wasn't big into charity. He did donate a million dollars to what would later be known as Vanderbilt University in Nashville. And the family underwrote cultural enterprises such as art galleries and museums. But it wasn't until the Gilded Age that Commodore's grandchildren established the family as a great philanthropic entity. Frederick Vanderbilt's wife, Louise Holmes, for example, was very generous in the Hyde Park area of New York doing everything from treating school children to an ice cream festival to buying a second-hand motion picture machine so the residents of Hyde Park could view movies in the town hall. And when Frederick Vanderbilt shuffled off to the big country club in the sky, he left a significant amount of money to his employees. William Kissam Vanderbilt, for his part, gave money to Columbia University and the YMCA, in addition to providing a million dollars for tenement housing. George Washington Vanderbilt II paid to design and support libraries, as well as arts activities and educational institutions. And Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney was a trained artist who used her family wealth to support female artists. Cornelius Vanderbilt II's eldest son, Cornelius III, or Neely, spent large amounts of money before falling out of favor with the family and once commented that every Vanderbilt son has increased his fortune except me. Cornelius II's youngest son, Reginald, was a playboy who gambled and drank often. On the night he turned 21, he celebrated coming into his $15.5 million inheritance by losing 70,000 at the gambling table. In 1922, Reginald married 17-year-old Gloria Morgan. She gave birth to their daughter, also named Gloria, in 1924. Reginald died the following year broke and in debt, leaving his wife and child with only the interest from his daughter's future trust fund. By the 1930s, the shipping industry was losing ground to other modes of transportation like cars, barges, and buses. With their economic dominance and decline, the Vanderbilt sold shares of their railroad holdings, opening the door for competition to gain majority share. The Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad, for example, acquired a large amount of New York Central stock and took over leadership, only to drive the company into bankruptcy during the 1950s and 60s. Additionally, Cornelius II and William Kissam's Fifth Avenue homes were torn down in 1926 as real estate developers bought land in a clamor to build skyscrapers. And the Vanderbilts were not in a financial position to maintain said land holdings. Within 30 years of Commodore's death, no member of the Vanderbilt family was among the wealthiest people in the United States. And by 1973, none of the 120 attendees at the Vanderbilt family reunion were millionaires. No word on whether they were still invited to play at the Millionaire All-Star Game. Gloria Vanderbilt, who was an actual person and not just a mascot for selling jeans, never really knew her father, Reginald Claypool Vanderbilt and her namesake mother was borderline neglectful. Gloria's aunt, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, enrolled Gloria in school and cared for her while her mother was gone for months at a time. Eventually, Gloria's mother returned and filed for official guardianship of her daughter, 
fearing her sister-in-law was trying to push her out of the child's life. Gertrude refused to hand the child over, claiming her mother was unfit. The issue went to trial in the 1930s, and Gloria's aunt won, though not without continued litigation and angst from her mom. As a teenager, Gloria became a socialite who went to Hollywood for a time before moving back to New York to study art and acting. She started designing jeans during the 1970s and later branched out to other kinds of fashion. Building on her family's fortune, she became financially successful and culturally iconic in her own right. Speaking of family fortune, CNN news anchor Anderson Cooper is the son of Gloria Vanderbilt and author Wyatt Emery Cooper, and he has known for some time that he won't be getting any of the family money. Most of us would be a little miffed at that, but old Anderson is okay with it. He even told Howard Stern, My mom's made clear to me that there's no trust fund. He then called inherited money as initiative sucker and a curse. Cooper, who makes millions of dollars a year working for CNN, said he always had a job growing up and, despite his mother's wealth, identifies with his father, who grew up poor in Mississippi. We think the Commodore would respect that. So what do you think? Which Vanderbilt story surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.